All right, we're with John Foster Pedley, Dean and Director of the Henley Business School Africa. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Um, by the way, this is uh, John appears on the cover of the HR Future magazine. Very nice, nice picture. Um, <clears throat> Tell uh, the Henley Business School for people who don't know. Can you just describe that Henley Business School Africa? Right. Well, we're part of a, a larger entity, which is part of the University of Reading in the UK. And Henley Business School is the oldest business school in Europe, one of the top twenty in the world for executive education. And we've been in South Africa for about twenty-eight years. And we provide two-thirds of all the MBA students that Henley has globally. Those operations are in Malaysia and around Europe and elsewhere. Two-thirds of those MBA students come from one country in Africa, and that's South Africa. And we've grown ballistically over the You're last You're kidding. Two-thirds of the MBAs I worldwide from Henley come from this from one here. country in Africa, yeah. Us. Why is that? Well, because we have a purpose. And we're, re we're reinventing the business school, um, which is we build a people, we build a businesses that build Africa. And I think that the purpose of a business school is not to churn out qualifications, but churn out capabilities. People who are going to build better businesses, future fit, and therefore build thriving economies. The days of the profit motive per se are gone. You have to think of prosperity. You have to think much wider. And the other reason why we do it in Africa is because we have a latent substantial number of talented, intelligent individuals who have not been given opportunity. Sorry, so, I just stopped listening to you there for a minute because oh, you wow. said you said that the uh, the days of the profit motive had gone. You mean Alan Greenspan, the former Federal Reserve Governor, was wrong when he said the sole duty of the shareholder is to make a profit. So did Milton Sorry, Freeman. for executives on behalf of the shareholder. Huh? I'm saying that, yes. I'm saying Milton Friedman also. They were right in their context, but we're not living in an infinite world. Profit companies cannot grow infinitely. And the consequences of profit growth on its own are so massive on large populations and on the system we're working in. We need now to, like Colin Mayer talks about, who was Dean of Said Business School in the UK, he talks about prosperity. Our new target is prosperity. Reduction of Gini coefficients and profit. We, of course, we need profit. It's important to have profit so we can grow the business. The Gini coefficient, of course, being the inequality, uh, the measure of inequality in a society. The fact that you're getting right. lots more money than I am yeah. in life. Okay? Right. And there's very few of you with lots of money. And very well, what money does this mean for business going forward? You know, when, when you have uh, that kind of intrusion from the social engineers uh, Why do you call and them government. Social engineers? Well, because they are trying to engineer, These they're are trying to use. These are hard economists. No, no, hang on a second. You are, you are using the uh, private enterprise to achieve an outcome which is divorced really from the, the, the sphere of influence of that business. No, the purpose of business is whatever the purpose of that business is. The business's purpose is not to make profit. My, our purpose is to build people who build a business that will build Africa. And in the process of achieving that, we must make a profit. Apple's purpose is something else. Google's is something else. They have a purpose. Profit must feed into that. So profit, what, profit but, is not the purpose. Are we not, of are we not all, at, at all times then sort of redefining? You know, what, what is the what is the boundary of uh, you know businesses' involvement in the social upliftment of a country? Um, That's a very moving target. Businesses create value for people. Business should should create things of value to you and me. Social upliftment is not a separate entity. Businesses should create things that help people thrive in their lives. Better products, better services, whatever, what, what have you. And they shouldn't be exploiting you for consumeristic gains and more addictive ends. That doesn't contribute to the well-being of life. And the profit motive alone won't sort that out. We as business people and business leaders need to think that our business should contribute to the well-being of our kids, of the families we're growing up in. That is not a separate social agenda. Business is everything. It's all forms of exchange, all forms of exchange of service or profit for some form of reward. We teach public sector, we teach state-operated enter enterprises, we teach um, businesses small and large, we develop entrepreneurs, we develop the creative sector. So it's not we're not talking about capitalistic, stock market-listed companies only. Good that they are, I'm not saying anything wrong. We're talking about the contribution of business as a human action to building better societies and better economies. Now, when we right. think of business in that, that sense, it might, you might say that as a business person, I just keep the boundary of my business. But we've all saw what happened with, with KPMG when they signed off accounts that they shouldn't have done. And that had a global impact on that company. 
right. because people were thinking that boundary of their responsibility was at the boundary of the business. It isn't anymore. Right, let's just and pick up on that point. Business if you, if let you me, let, let me pick up on that point about KPMG. Of course, it wasn't the only one. You had Deloitte and you had Price Waterhouse Coopers and so on. All of the big firms uh, have been involved in, globally in some very, very dodgy engagements with, with clients. And they are people like, forgive me, us. Okay, they're not some extraordinary wicked people. They're normal people doing right. their best in organizations. So how does that kind of thing happen if they're ordinary people? How does that happen? What's I wrong? Think, I think we train people to, under, to think, I think the, the Milton Friedman doctrine and profit doctrine is, 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 is problematic in this context because then you only think my, my limit and my responsibility is on making my company profitable, irrespective of the social consequences, even the global reputational consequences. Right. And the fact that this KPMG was a globally connected company, but acting locally, yeah. So we're not training people to think of causality beyond the short term. Right. We need to train people to think systemically, to think of long chains of causality, to understand the impact they're having, and the benefit that that will have on businesses. You will build substantial, thriving businesses that are embedded in creating deep value, not minor value, and that deep value will help grow economies and therefore grow societies. Well, let's talk about chief financial officers for a minute, because right. the KPIs, the key performance indicators that they use, are extremely numerical they are based around finances it's return on equity it's uh, it's it's cash flow it's growth percentages and that sort of thing are there better measures for the finance department why are we only talking about uh, CFOs as a finance department that's our first era CFOs are integral to the building and modeling of business models and businesses as entities are great value they're not just measuring the money they're working out how to invest in things that are going to increase the value of the organization. The first mistake is to load the level of thinking of CFOs to be operational um, you know, bookkeepers or financial managers. They're not. They're, they're, they're business uh, people. And KPIs are also deeply misunderstood. If you look at a balanced scorecard, which in a sense was a poison pill for CFOs, in the nicest possible way, to stop that exact dynamic you talked about, we talked about financial indicators, customer indicators, experience indicators, internal performance indicators, and then learning and innovation indicators. Having all those KPIs together, but equally and dispassionately assessed, creates a model, a system of KPIs that helps innovate and grow the business. You're talking about too often lagging indicators with, with financial indicators. And also, people often forget that KPI is an experiment. You want this outcome, but I've got this, this, and this. And I'm going to measure these three things, but even I'll get that outcome. Too often, you don't get the outcome. The KPI was the thing you thought would do it. KPIs are hypotheses and experiments. When, you, when you're not measuring the right thing, therefore you're not getting the right outcome, shift what you're measuring. You've got to be very good as a CFO at assessing what you're measuring to see if it really ties into the business outcome. And then you've got to move your sense of the business as just being financial. The CEO is not shouldn't have to engage with the CFO in a sort of dialectic conversation, me against you, with the CMO and, the, and logistics and the CHR. They shouldn't be all at each other's head. They should be talking about the business as an entity and intelligently and systemically talking about how to grow that. Well, there's another viewpoint on that too, is that maybe there should be some tension. There should be some dynamic tension in an organization between totally the chief executive and the chief financial officer. The chief financial officer says, no, you want more money, you're not going to get it. The CEO says, hey, we need to build a new no, plant no, in no, Egypt. No, we need money. The chief financial officer shouldn't necessarily be saying no to the money. The chief financial officer should be assessing whether that use of that money is wise, is going to grow the value of the business. And so when you're coming up the ranks as a, as a market, as a cost accountant, you're worrying about expenditure and saving costs. When you get to CFO, you're worrying about intelligent global investment. Am I going to put this amount of money here or here for that outcome? You're an investment leader, not, right. not, not a cost but control. Is it not of course part you're of cost the, control. And that is one of the problems in the dynamic. Is it not part of the human condition that uh, people will spend everything that they have, whether you're an individual or a corporation, they'll spend everything that they have and more if allowed. So you have to have somebody who's going to put restraints, whether it's in the, in the household or it's in the it's company. Part of the human That's condition. the tension. The other that I'm part of the about. human condition is that there is a better side to you and I, a wiser side, that will challenge that tendency in ourselves. If we treat 
people as those people are always going to do wrong and think like that, they will do because you'll patronize them. But intelligent CFOs who are mature, wise individuals, those are what we want. Well, they won't be doing that. They will understand both sides. If they don't, we're not training them well enough. We're not, we're not raising them. And those are the people we need for this world we're growing into. John, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much. You That's very much. John Foster Pedley, Dean and Director of the Henley Business School Africa. Thank you, John. Thank you.